Hello, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. And thank you so much for your introduction, uh, Director Alexander Stapp. It is amazing to be working with you. And it's also amazing to be at today's very important COVID summit. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. I have a very uh, well established and amazing panel uh, that will be talking about this information, which is a key topic in the context of COVID-19. Um, well, I want to start with a positive. Um, it is a special day today. Today is the birthday of my son, which is a personal thing, which is always nice. But it's also good for our life right now, I would say. There is a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. The sun shines and more and more people are getting vaccinated. Uh, working from home is not all that bad whilst the light is at the end of the tunnel. However, uh, we will only get out of the crisis well and fast, uh, depending on the uptake of the vaccination. And if this information is still a serious problem and people are, for unfair reasons, distrusting vaccines, then it will take much longer before we can get to normal. And we will also have more casualties. So this information in the space of both COVID-19 people that are denying the problem, but also people that are un, well, unprepared to take a vaccine because they have the feeling that you can become an autist if you use the vaccine or that you can die for unfair reasons is really a gigantic societal problem. So therefore, it's key that we have this panel on this information. And I'm very excited that we can do that. Uh, ETMO is, is the, uh, the European Digital Media Observatory that is vested in the School of Transnational Governance. And uh, both Miguel Maduro and I are leading uh, ETMO. And what we're doing is we bring together fact checkers, media uh, literacy experts, and academic researchers to understand and analyze the disinformation uh, problem. We do that in collaboration with media organizations, but also online platforms and media literacy uh, practitioners. So I would say ETMO works on this information, but we are very much keen to get also your input. So also this conversation will be used as input as certain research be done. And one thing I would like to light out on before we head into the panel, I will introduce the awesome uh, uh, speakers in this panel, is that we did some research to the work of fact checkers. And what we've seen is that more than 70% of the work of fact checkers at this moment in time is focused on debunking COVID-19 and vaccination disinformation. So this is really top of mind also of the fact-checking community. So having said all that, I am very keen to introduce an awesome panel. First of all, Commissioner Vice President Vera Jourova, welcome so much. It's so good to have you. Uh, I know you uh, for your work on this information, for your work on strengthening the media landscape. And that's why I'm a great fan of yours, because I think your multidimensional approach is going to be the best going forward to tackle this very tough and, and, and multi-prone uh, uh, problem as it is of this information. Then another awesome P team member is Saida El Ramli. She is the di di DG, the Director General of uh, dot, uh, uh, dot, uh, Digital Online Tech Europe. And, um, and as this European trade organization, you're leading uh, for internet companies on the European digital policy. And I think that's really important that you're here because we're of course also interested to hear what the online platforms have to say. On the other hand, we're also very much aware of the fact that it's not just the online platforms that deal with this uh, issue, but also many, many more. Then also, well, and dialing in, and that's the good thing of working from home because it's dialing in from Australia, the uh, Mr. Honorable Malcolm Thurnbull. He uh, was the prime minister of Australia between 20, 2015 and 2018. And he is well known for shouting out this information by officials and he's also of course 
co-chairing the um, the R for R committee together with Borosso. So this is in short our panels. I would really love to give first the floor to Commissioner Jarova uh, uh, to talk about uh, the widespread of online disinformation that is a challenge as it is, just also outside of the COVID-19 space. And we're very interested in how you uh, tackle this disinformation challenge uh, um, in your policy so far within the European Commission. Please, uh, Vera Jarova, can I ask you to answer that question for us? Thank you very much, Madeleine, and thank you, Edmo, for inviting me. This is a great, a great honor for me to, to be also in the, in the panel with such distinguished uh, co-speakers. Well, this is uh, the question which might fo be followed by analysis of where we are. I, but I will shorten it because you want to hear the solutions which we are proposing for Europe. Well, you said that uh, we might see the, the, the end of the tunnel, uh, speaking about the COVID crisis. Of course, we all know that uh, the consequences of COVID will live with us uh, very long. Uh, and speaking about technologies uh, and good and bad things, uh, and I also want to speak first about positive things, while well, technologies are enabling us to, to keep going. Yeah, that's why we are now able to, to share views together and to spread our ideas also uh, to, to many other places and many other people. But of course, all the good things have always been in history uh, abused by bad actors. And we have seen a lot of it. Uh, they can uh, increase divisions uh, in our society. They were doing it already before COVID. So this is not a new phenomenon now. Uh, they can influence elections. They can uh, do it uh, by the tools like, like bots and fake likes, uh, fake accounts paid for content and all boost certain information to the top of our screens. So this is, this is the reality. <clears throat> what we had to do uh, after COVID uh, burst out, uh, we had to uh, realize that the, the too much is at stake and that we have to intensify our work against this information. I will put aside now illegal uh, content and spread of illegal content because it's, it's another category. But uh, we needed to act uh, in COVID. We continued and intensified what we already did before and just, just a little jump to the history. Uh, before the European elections in 2019, we were, if I may say, panicking a little bit <laughs> that uh, the elections could be the competition of dirty methods and uh, dirty uh, ways how to influence uh, the, the public opinion. We saw that there was a risk of stealing the private data and, and micro-targeting the, the, the viewers or the, the, the voters. And uh, we, so already before the elections, we came with the code of practice, which uh, several big platforms committed to, to respect and to, to run uh, under, under, under the roof of, of the code of practice, uh, which we are now upgrading. Yeah, because we we need to we had to assess how the code of practice worked, and whether it is it is bearing fruits and to to upgrade uh, its uh, its uh, functioning. So this is what we are doing now, and the code of practice uh, should be prepared uh, by mid this year. And of course, when I say we, I don't speak only about the Commission. Uh, we are doing it together with the big platforms because it will be their instrument and their commitment to, to do more against the disinformation. Uh, we uh, stand a long time ahead of the Hamlet's question to regulate or not to regulate the digital sphere. And I was a big believer in self-regulatory measures. And you might know that we have the code of conduct against hate speech. We already had some legislation against uh, 
the the uh, illegal content relating to child uh, uh, sexual abuse terrorism and so on but the crunch time came last year when we decided to regulate uh, and not to continue uh, the re reliance on self-regulatory measures because uh, we don't have only the big tech which committed to uh, run these self-regulatory uh, measures, but, but we have many other actors and we needed to cover the whole European uh, digital market. So that's why we adopted the Digital Services Act, which clarifies the rules for taking down illegal content and very large platforms uh, will be obliged to assess and mitigate the risks their systems pose by harmful content to the protection of our societies. And the system should work in the following way. Uh, the, once the Digital Services Act will come into force, which might happen in two, three years, uh, depending on the speed of the legislative process. And we know that this is a controversial piece of <laughs> legislation, which will raise a lot of diverging reactions. Already now we see that from member states and uh, from the European Parliament. But once it will come into force, we would like to continue the code of practice against disinformation uh, as the uh, contribution, as a self-regulatory contribution to mitigate the risk of the impact of the, of the harmful content. And as a follow-up, uh, we are going to legislate this year the, the political campaigning and online advertising before the elections. So it will be complement to the Digital, Digital Services Act. But coming back to the, um, uh, the COVID-19 time, uh, I realized one thing, that to fight against this information, be it online, but also in, in media, because we have to take a broader picture here, uh, it's not about removing harmful content. It's not about uh, addressing uh, behavior, malicious behavior of the well-known actors, including foreign actors, which are uh, attacking our, our European space. But it is about, and sorry to be, uh, I will be a little bit pathetic, uh, it is about the fight for the truth. <laughs> and it was clearly revealed in the COVID time that if the authorities will not uh over flood the digital space but also the the media space uh, in in broader uh, terms by the reliable and trustworthy information based on science because COVID needs to uh let science speak and convince the people then we will be we will be losing because the fantastic ability of disinformers and this is a coordinated action yeah this is not just the production of some innocent rumors there is something coordinated and intentional happening so if we do not uh, fill in the space they will do that and they are doing that that's why in covid time we made an agreement with the big platforms and shada could speak about that later how it is how it looks like from the other perspective, that they will uh, take extraordinary measures. And yes, we here we speak about removing content which is manifestly dangerous for the health of people. But this is not normal. This is not normal time and this is not normal method. And our normal method, which we want to keep, is uh, the fact checking. That's why it's important that now we are uh, under the organization of EDMO, which is a, a big contribution to uh, the systemic and, and well done and tr trustworthy fact checking. Uh, we need to increase transparency of what's happening online, curb manipulative techniques and reduce economic incentives for spreading disinformation and raise awareness. Because when we fight against disinformation, we have to be aware that we have three players here those who produce, those who disseminate, and those who believe. And let's be honest, we tend to believe what we want to believe. Uh, so to change 
the mindset, the ideas, the, the beliefs of people. This is uh, a, long, a long distance run. But the first step to achieve that is to uh, convince the people that they should not believe everything they read. <laughs> and this is about the media literacy. This is about education. And here the EU is already investing a lot in it together with the member states. Uh, I have not spoken about two things, about coming back to, to the regulation and partly the Digital Services Act and the code of practice. Inevitably, we have to speak about how the algorithms work. Because I, I use this, this comparison many times. Uh, we see that the algorithms uh, work as a method to sell the products. Yeah, because the platforms serve uh, are, are first of all the advertisers or the, the, the space for advertising. And for me, it's a different thing if the algorithm is used to segment the, the, the target groups of consumers to sell better the products like shoes or I don't know vacuum cleaners, but it does it is not the same thing as the algorithms which work to sell the politicians, the ideas, the ideologies to citizens. I make a big difference here between consumers and citizens. And I have nothing against consumers. I worked in consumers policy for years and I will always do everything to protect their interests. But here too much is at stake because it is about democracy, about freedom of speech, about the ability to lead the horizontal political or a citizens debate. And this is where we see a big problem because in online space, we do not see such a horizontal debate anymore. We see the echo chambers, the people are used to debate with those who have the same opinions and then they come to the real world where let's face it, they are confronted with democratic system, which is a big noise, which is a big fight of, of opinions and they do not feel comfortable. So we hear it from many people, democracy is not comfortable anymore because it is not delivering security, justice, certainty. So this is dangerous game. And that's why we want to address it mainly by our legislation to come in November, which is targeted to, to the political campaigning. And uh, Madeleine, you, you look satisfied, but I think I speak too long, don't I? <laughs> yeah, but, but I'm, I'm like, I, I thank you so much for that. And I think uh, your approach is, is very appealing because it's multidimensional. You are talking about societal resilience, which is a very important element. And of course, under the Audiovisual Media Service Directive, there is already the, the obligation for member states to yes. work on media literacy. And we as ETMO, are really there also to provide materials and collect and, and be a center of excellence and a repository. And also fact checking is key and consumer protection. So that's that's really important. At the same time, you also talk about the function of, of democracy and the, the freedom of expression. And that that is very important as an element in all of this. And therefore diligence is, is important. And I think European Commission can be very proud of, of being the first to be able to have a, a code of practice in place worldwide. And you are also explaining about, well, that it's now, uh, you know, time to start moving further towards regulation. The DSA reflects on that. Uh, but we, before we move to uh, legislation, I think it's also good to talk a little bit more about this self-regulatory system, uh, because I think think that also both Malcolm and uh, Saida have something to say about that as well. Uh, because that, of course, is, as I understand you correctly, something that will also still be in place. So I think, you know, doing both will probably be most effective because self-regulation is well known. And this is something that we're interested very much in the School of Transnational Governance as well as being a good instrument to internalize norms. However, we want to make sure that that is really enough. So let me now transition to Saidi. To, uh, Saidi, sorry for mispronouncing your name, Siada, uh, to talk about, um, you know, the measures that uh, the platforms already took. Because, of course, as uh, Commissioner Jarova just explained, the, the online platforms were asked to 
already work on this information, have these monthly reports, but especially step up in the contents of COVID-19 because that context is actually deadly. So could you explain to us a little bit more about the efforts the platforms took to actually uh, report on the one hand and on the other hand, what kind of measures were taken by the online platforms to, to tackle this information and to provide the, the correct, the truth information, if there is such a notion as truth, however, but at least fact-checked information. Thank you very much, Madeline. Thank you to Edmo for having me. And it's a pleasure to be uh, on this uh, very esteemed panel on this important issue. Um, I think in her usual manner, Vice President Jurova, with utter humility, uh, kind of swept over the role that she and her team had, had played in the last year with regards to uh, tackling COVID-19 uh, COVID disinformation. And I would like to actually take a minute to just remember where we started our journey on trying to tackle that collectively. We uh, were called into a meeting before the lockdown um, into uh, Vice President Jurova's office. And when I say we, it means the signatories, the platform signatories of the code of practice, uh, right at the start of the pandemic at, a, at an EU level, where, where it starts to become a real issue. Uh, and we're asked, what are you going to do about this? And we got some really difficult questions and the Vice President was very transparent in getting all of the, her colleagues from the different parts of the commission there as well, so that there was an open discussion as to how the industry would do what they need to do. And was also asking us very clearly, how are you going to make sure to tackle it across each and every member state? And I remember very clearly at, at that point in time, as I said, it was, we were not wearing masks yet. We were not in a lockdown situation. It was very much the starting point. And I remember the companies one after the other saying, we're on top of it, but bear with us because we have to start somewhere. Uh, we're working with the WHO because that's where we have some established content uh, con uh, contacts to get authoritative content. Um, but for the rest, we're prioritizing geographies according to where the impact is. At that point in time, Italy was in a very dire state. And so the contact with the Ministry of Health in Italy was the primary uh, priority at that point. Uh, but the vice president was there leading that debate. And she's she's been very hands-on throughout this process, something that we have very much appreciated from herself and her team. And I did want to mention that because I think, as I said, with her humility, she just kind of swept over it as if, as if it's business as usual, but it's very much appreciated that she was very much involved and that we always had a discussion about what needed. We were also being asked what the commission could do to help. And we did need help because on COVID, as you can imagine, there were so many dimensions to the disinformation issue. There were dimensions with, there was the angle for, uh, with regards to the virus and disinformation on the virus, with regards to disinformation on the measures that should be taken, um, on potential remedies, and all kinds of different versions of what could be remedies. And then finally on the vaccines, and at every step, we needed to have some kind of idea of who we could turn to. Um, and having a central point uh, with the commission to be able to say, we need help with the member states. We need the, uh, the member states to be clear on what it is they would like to push forward, for example, in terms of information. When one member state is saying masks should not be worn and the neighboring member state was at that point in time making it mandatory, uh, it, it could be easy to say we just take whatever is coming out of the Ministry of Health, but obviously we're talking about the EU, which is a block. And so what is being pushed forward? So we had the WHO messaging, we had Ministry of Health messaging, but we needed to have some form of coordination. So that has been very much appreciated. And how did we actually tackle it? So part, part of it was... Again, we don't want to be judge and jury of what is allowed on the internet. That's not our role. Um, but what we did try and do is there were moments where we had to remove a blatant disinformation. There was tackling the actual behavior where there's a concerted effort to spread disinformation. This is not misinformation. This is not something that happens by accident. I believe the vice president mentioned that, that as well. Um, these are concerted efforts to spread it either for commercial gain 
or uh, or for malicious reasons, basically. And so that we needed to take action towards the actual behavior itself. That happened as well. Can, and can then I interrupt you for one second? Hmm. Because uh, we are very interested in numbers. So can you give us some numbers about you know, the, the level of where this was happening, because that will be key for our understanding of the scale. So the numbers are very much dependent on the service that we're referring to. And there, uh, Madeleine, uh, all of the reports have been made available by the companies on the exact numbers as well. So I would uh, suggest that you have a look at the reports on that, uh, because otherwise I would literally be picking a number out of the hat. And I don't think that that would be um, an accurate representation of the numbers as such, because it's very different depending on which uh, methods were used by which service provider. Yeah, reading the reports, the numbers are rather substantial. So I just try to uh, seduce. They are, they are. And um, and I think the numbers are very substantial on in terms of takedown and action like I would say the more uh, direct action in, in dealing with the disinformation, but also in pushing the authoritative content. So I think that that's uh, referring to your introductory remarks on how important it is now, for example, that there's a good understanding about the vaccines. I think that is something not to be uh, forgotten either. Making sure that when people are looking for COVID information, that the right information is out there. Is def has definitely been a concerted effort across all of the services um, and def a more positive way of trying to push uh, a better narrative on the COVID issue. Um, if I may then, in terms of lessons learned, because I do think we've learned a lot. We started uh, on the code of practice a few years ago, uh, heading towards the European parliamentary elections. So that was a more a political goal. Um, the fact that the code of practice was more, uh, well, I don't want to say looser, but it wasn't as uh, clearly defined in terms of objective just to tackle the um, European elections had, did give us the possibility to be able to follow through on our commitments throughout the COVID um, period. But one thing we have definitely learned, uh, which was very different from the, situ the situation now than in 2019 when we were working towards the European elections, was how important collaboration is. Collaboration with the authorities, be it at the EU level with the Commission, or be it with the Ministries of Health and the WHO. Um, collaboration with media, because um, that is one area that I think it also going forward, apart from media literacy, we need to have a better understanding on what messaging uh, through the media can be pushed forward. We're hearing more and more uh, claims from some of the media sector that they would like to see all editorial content not being considered disinformation. And um, that in itself would be a, 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 quite a shift because at the moment we're talking about authoritative content coming from, um, I don't want to, uh, completely objective parties such as, for example, the WHO that have a public health um, obligation to spread the information that they have, a scientific backing. And the media is not exact, doesn't have that scientific backing behind it. So what is the role of the media in there? Um, but also to, to try and incorporate the media ecosystem. I believe the industry has always worked in good faith on the COVID crisis. We always showed up to the meetings, always tried to uh, come up with the reports and which hasn't always been easy because at a certain point, I remember the request going to having monthly reports. And that was a moment where everybody had to gulp for air for a second. How are we going to make sure that we have all this data at a monthly level? Um, but it was done. And it, I think it shows the continued willingness of the industry to put its best foot forward on this particular and very important issue. Thank you. Uh, can, I, can I break in for a second? Because yeah. you were talking about authoritative sources. Yeah. And we have a question from the audience, and I think that's a very interesting question that I would mm -hmm. like to put in front 
also for the other panelists and I will transition after this into to Malcolm because yeah. uh, uh, he will be talking about uh, initiatives uh, that are taken, of course, also in Australia on the self-regulatory code. And what can we learn from that? But before we get there, I would really like to, 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 to get this question across to, to you maybe first. And I'm also interested what uh, Commissioner Jarova thinks of that. The question is from Nigeria, from Princess Uyu Nwafor Orizu. And probably my pronunciation will not be perfect. She is a health sciences librarian. Mm -hmm. uh, in Nigeria, and she asked the following, regarding infodemic and tackling online disinformation, I think a special committee of WHO should be mandated to be the only reliable source of information on COVID-19 and must ensure uh, absolute scientific and factual proofs of everything, anything before publishing or broadcast in any form or media. So that is very interesting. It somehow seems to rely on the fact that there is something as absolute truth. And I think that might be a little bit of a challenge because we also have insight when, because we are really uh, building uh, um, the, the house uh, when we're living already in it, of course, because we started vaccination as soon as we could. So we have also, you know, insight popping up. But I was wondering, do you think uh, WHO should have World Health Organization should have a specific role to play in, in, in telling authoritative truths and only them and no one else. So I think the WHO definitely has a role to play, but I would not venture as far as them being the only uh, source of truth because frankly, a lot of what has been happening with regards to the COVID-19 crisis, not even at national uh, 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 national issues, but sometimes it's very local. Sometimes we're talking about a, com a community, a commune um, um, level kind of decisions that have a major impact on people. Um, if you live in one part of Brussels, you're allowed to walk out on, uh, on your street without a face mask. And that was the case for months. Uh, in another, you had to wear a face mask wherever you went. Those are the kinds of things that people needed to have reassurance on. And that is authoritative in terms of what the measures are. And I don't believe we can count on the WHO to go into that level of granularity. Thank you for it. Commissioner Jarova, what is your thinking on this one? I'm so curious about what Malcolm will speak, uh, that say that I will be short. Uh, WHO, of course, ha has the role, uh, but uh, to be the only arbiter of the guaranteed truth, I would fear. <laughs> uh, this is uh, for the national authorities. Speaking about Europe, yeah, European Union, because I know the question is from Nigeria, but, but in European Union, uh, it's the member states' competence to get, take care of the health of people. That's why they should be able to collect the scientific uh, findings, which are trustworthy, which are reliable, uh, and accompany it with the instructions for the people uh, how to behave and what to do to, to be protected, yeah? So, so uh, if, if we are not in a luxurious situation when only the scientific truth will help to, to, to cure us, yeah? It must be something more practical, but the, the scientific voice is very important. We always speak about the Robert Koch uh, Institute in Germany, which is playing that role. Each, each country has such an authority. Uh, and one, one more thing, it's also a language language matter. Uh, the people should be served in their own language, uh, uh, quick information, trustworthy, uh, and so on. Thank you very much. So reform for resilience, uh, um, that is like uh, my segue. And, and, and I would say uh, uh, prime minister, former prime minister, but now co-chair of uh, reform for resilience, uh, uh, I would very much like to get your vision on the, the truth uh, about vaccination and your, uh, your uptick of the, the lessons learned from the European Union on the code of practice. So can I ask you two questions? One, uh, wh what lessons would Australia would love to learn from what happened around the code of practice, both the good and the bad in the EU? And at the same time, 
I know you are calling out regularly also authorities or, or officials on not telling the truth on COVID-19 and vaccinations, which I think it's very good that you're doing that. But could you tell me what source of truth uh, should be referred to and what do, do you think about this question from coming from uh, the princess from Nigeria? Well, thank you very much, Madeline and Siada and Vera. It's wonderful to be with you. Um, can I just say right at the outset, we, the COVID pandemic is, has been like an examination for the, all the nations of the world. Uh, all countries, uh, depending on their stage of development, are at any given time more or less confronting the same problems. You know, whether it is housing, health, education, the whole, everyone's handling it and sim handling similar problems. And as a general rule, we don't pay enough attention to what others are doing because we can learn a lot from them. So your institute is, plays an enormously important role in that regard. Um, now with COVID, however, what's interesting is that everyone's been facing the same problem at exactly the same time. So it's like being back at university or school and you know, all the students are sitting in the examination hall with their pens poised and the invigilator looks at her watch and says, right, uh, pick up your pen, start writing, you have three hours. And we all you know, started writing. Um, now, <clears throat> so what, what have we learned? Well, some of the things we've learned are obviously those countries whose government's policies followed the science, uh, and when I say science, I mean medical science, not political science, uh, and they followed the medical science, and in places where there was a high level of trust in the government, you had a much better experience of the pandemic. And I think Australia and New Zealand obviously did very well, but you know, the country that uh, uh, that was that has probably done the best is actually Taiwan. And and you know, Taiwan's challenges were very real, of course, being so close to the uh, you know the center of the start of the outbreak. So um, so that's that's critically important. Um, the the challenge uh, has been, I think, to maintain that trust. Um, and to combat fake news and misinformation. Now, how do you do that in a free society? That's, that is the challenge. Um, you know, different countries have got slightly different views on free speech. The Americans obviously are the most extreme. But the problem, the fundamental problem that we face is that the whole principle of, you know, free speech, First Amendment, you know, American context, is based on the premise that in the battle of ideas, the truth will prevail. But yet, as Emily Bazelon wrote last year, we are drowning in lies, okay? So the, the answer has to be, and these are lessons that I've learned the hard way in politics, I can tell you. You have to confront misinformation uh, in, a, in a, a viral sense, you know, in a social media sense, you have to confront it like you're playing whack-a-mole. You know, that game where you have to, every time the mole sticks his head up, you have to hit it. Because <clears throat> there used to be a view uh, in politics until relatively recently and in government that you could ignore outrageous lies and fake news because conspiracy theories, because if you responded to them and contradicted them, you would end up giving them more salience. You know, you'd be, you'd be raising their profile. Unfortunately, the lesson we've learned is that out, even the most outrageous lies can get enormous traction very quickly online. And, you know, this is, this is bad enough in a democratic environment. I mean, Vera was talking about this earlier. I mean, I think it's not just a social media problem. I mean, you look at some of Rupert Murdoch's uh, outlets, particularly Fox News in the United States, which was telling millions and millions of viewers that Joe Biden had not won the election, but had rather stolen it, with the consequence that you had an armed mob 
storming the American Congress, i.e. their parliament. You know, this is wild stuff. This is stuff so outrageous that it would have defied the imaginations of a scriptwriter a decade ago, but it's actually happening. So lies and misinformation are not just to be found on social media, on Facebook and Twitter and so forth. But the answer is that you have to call it out. I think different countries have got different standards in terms of what can be done in terms of censorship or moderation. Uh, but <clears throat> at the very least, it has to be addressed, addressed very aggressively. I think one option uh, is to make sure that the platforms, I don't know whether this is being done in Europe, but that if, you know, for example, fake information about vaccines is being peddled, uh, is to make sure that um, viewers, readers, whatever, are being also drawn to the official government uh, Department of Health information. Now, of course, this presupposes people trust the government. Because, you know, the, if you don't trust the government, then you look at that and you say, well, that's just, you know, um, what, what Q has told me to be wary of, all these lies from the, the giant lizards that are running the government, you know. Um, <clears throat> so, so building trust uh, is critically important. I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from governments in building trust, frankly, and that is to be to tell the truth and to be very upfront and make sure people feel that as new information is coming to hand, they're being told it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I but I I, I just think you it has to be responded to very rapidly, and 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 you know that may involve um, you know uh, uh, an advertising campaign from government. We haven't needed to do this here. It's been a little bit of it. But, you know, you, where you actually say, look, you know, your friend around the corner or your, uh, you know, Facebook friend or uh, your Twitter uh, correspondent may well be telling you things about <clears throat> vaccines. Don't take any notice of that. This is the place to go for the information. And you just have to really, uh, really be very emphatic about that. But don't assume that the misinformation is just coming from social media. I mean, curated media, in many respects, far too much of it has lost all moorings with truth. And, you know, this is a, you know, that's a big issue for the Vera touched on earlier with the liberal democracy. I mean, undermining the public's faith in established institutions has been one of the key objectives of Russia's disinformation campaign. But, you know, frankly, Vladimir Putin can, can uh, you know, focus on something else in many Western democracies because the media are doing it for him. Thank you for that. So, so you were focusing on the relation between the decay of trust in institutions and yeah. the susceptibility to disinformation. And I think yes. that's very interesting and important uh, observation you're making there. At the same time, you're saying, well, maybe, um, uh, so I, I don't think you're saying you have to get rid of the disinformation because you're also saying, well, we have to have um, um, a marketplace of different kind of information, but at least we need to have a place of truth that is put next to the disinformation so people have alternatives. But then yeah, you, you see that, Madeline. If I could just, if I could just yeah. put this in context, and I think everyone will be familiar with this. If you go back, uh, say, twenty years, to be conservative, most media was curated, so you needed to get your message out to a big audience. You needed an editor or a producer or a director to let you on the platform. And secondly, most media sought to attract a very large audience to maximize their the eyeballs or readers so that they could maximize their revenue. Now what's happened is that technolo technological changes have made it much easier to produce uh, you know media content, be it text, audio, visual or whatever, uh, and to disseminate it, you know the internet. Uh, and so what you now have, and you, of course you have, all the social media platforms which are not curated. So basically, 
people can live in echo chambers yeah. uh, where everything it becomes an ecosystem where their prejudices are being reinforced and the algorithms that Vera was talking about earlier are critically important because if the algorithm is saying, you know, if you are a, if you are a vaccine sceptic, you know, an anti-vaxxer, and then you just keep on getting served more and more content confirming everything you already believe, you know, what that does is make the situation worse. Whereas in a day, in the days of, you know, before all of this, if you're watching a, a more a mainstream media outlet, you would be more likely to see a balance of views. So these are, these are and we shouldn't underestimate the damage this does potentially, and I think in America actually, kinetically, to liberal democracy. Yeah, so the confirmation bias is absolutely a very relevant element. And we mm. also see, however, research by, for instance, the University of Oxford showing that people that are in that bubble are mostly staying inside of that bubble and maybe the bubble doesn't really grow a lot. So you could also see that uh, people don't um, uh, spread from outside that bubble. So for that, for instance, the elections are not won through these kinds of bubble. But I would like to you know, bridge for the last question towards uh, Commissioner uh, Jarova, because you are saying, and this was an element that I was trying to, to light out, is that trust in governments is essential. And I would say the approach of the European Commission towards this information is very multidimensional, taking care of all different elements, including well, creating more societal resilience and media literacy to avoid people ending up in those confirmation biases caused by uh, filter bubbles. But at the same time, it's very important that governments and EU institutions are trust. Bless you. So I would like, uh, as a final question to, to uh, Commissioner Jirov, I would like to ask you, what are you doing to help further the growth in, in institutions within the EU, as that is a key element for, uh, uh, for, for the tackling of the problem that we are ahead of today. I think for disinformation, you can do whatever you want, but it's like it's going to stay an open tap if people really want to believe the disinformation because they don't like to trust the institutions and the government. So, uh, Commissioner Jirova, can you um, close off by sharing with you what you are doing in the Commission to make sure that we trust as citizens what's coming out of, of the institutions on the COVID-19 uh, issue? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, is it really true that I am getting the last word? This, what a day. <laughs> thank you very much. And I will try not to spoil it or da damage the, the last impression. What should we do? Uh, I, I, I think I have a very primitive uh, answer. Uh, we have to be transparent, uh, honest and open ourselves. Yeah, because if we start to lie or uh, draw the rosy picture, uh, I think that the trust will be lost forever, yeah? So uh, this is also uh, part of our philosophy of our communication. Uh, you know, we are under permanent attack from outside, especially from Russia. And I've been many times asked, how will you counter that? Will you also uh, design uh, propagandist attacks? which will be spread in Russia. And my answer is, well, uh, it's, it's not our plan. It's not in our DNA, uh, if I may say, uh, but uh, we have to focus on communication with our own citizens. And again, to be, to be open, transparent, and, and uh, to, to tell the people the truth. And that's the tragedy of these days that uh, when the politicians are caught lying, it doesn't disqualify them anymore. Yeah, so I think that we, we should come back to decency and, uh, and the, the basic principles of, of uh, decent society, but this is maybe too naive. And what Malcolm said that in the past, uh, there was a, the, or that, that the concept of the freedom of speech is based on the conviction that the truth will always win. Well, let's help truth to win. This is our job.
That is such a beautiful clothing. Thank you so much for that. And we're all in this together and we have to see this as an um, as a as a something we have to do, which is ex extremely important, both from the institutional side, but also from all those involved in the uh, media ecosystem. I would also want to call out the role of academics to really finally conclude this session, because academics can provide independent oversight. And I would love also the online platforms to help academics and to make sure that there is access to the information uh, academics would need. And ECMO will be there to provide a safe and secure, safe harbor access to be able to also make sure that we can all scrutinize what is going on on those platforms. Uh, so we're all in this together and I'm really looking forward to take this to the next steps, stay true, stay true to democracy and stay true to the truth on this information to be able to fight it and to get rid of this horrible disease as soon as we can. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Great panel for, for Thank being you, Edmond. Thank you, Madeleine. Have a good Thank day. Thank you so much. Bye.